sorry. <laughs>
So there is an opportunity, right, for somebody to come in and organize this kind of financial system, a central credit system. Okay. Uh, environmental systems, similar thing, right? Some companies don't have the environmental management system in place. So that's going to be a trend in the future. The companies need to put in environmental management system. Information technology. Are there still many areas in Russia and China who don't have access to internet? If you go to the countryside, western China, do you think there are areas that don't have internet access? Uh, maybe. In Russia we have a lot of places where there is no internet. Okay, so there's an opportunity there, right, for putting in the internet and those kinds of things. Improving the healthcare. <coughs> so, <coughs> usually, if we want to sell a product, and if we make a very simple uh, Microsoft Excel study about where we should sell our products. What country do you think usually comes out on top? If we check population and GDP, right? Which country do you think would be the best one usually to sell our product in? <laughs> the United States, right? Most products, if you look at the GDP of people and you look at the population, the United States has a, popula a very large population, right? Nearly 300 million people. They all have a, the average income is about forty, nearly forty thousand dollars a year. Okay, their it, distribution system is easy, right? They have a good infrastructure. Distribution system is not that bad. So if I was to take any product, we talked about men's face cream before. We talked about women's makeup, right? I could say the U.S. I could choose the U.S. Right? They have a high income. It's a big market. If I start off in New York. And then I can expand and expand and expand and keep going, right? Then next to the US there's Canada and Mexico on the other side, right? So if I just start in Ireland, maybe their income is the same as the US, but they don't have the same population or same potential for selling a product, okay? So the US is a very important market in the world. So uh, if you're selling a product, the US gives good opportunity. Even we talk about the musicians, musicians from the UK, they talk about cracking the US market, right? Okay, they're famous in the UK, but how many people live in the UK? 60 million, okay? There's nearly 300 million living in the US. So if that musician can sell their CDs in the US, they can make so much more money than just in the UK. And the same for British comedians. British comedians, they all want to crack the US market. Do you understand to crack the market? It means to open the market, right? So for example, do you know Oasis? Yes. When I was a teenager, Oasis was the most popular <laughs> group. I went to an Oasis concert. But Oasis never cracked the US. People in the US don't listen to Oasis. They probably don't know who Oasis are. They tried, they went there and they did some concerts, but they couldn't. People didn't like their music that much. Okay. The Beatles, the Beatles cracked the US, so they made a lot of money. Okay, so for any, any product, <coughs> if you can crack the US market, it's a market of almost 300 million people with an average income of about $40,000, right? So it's a nice market to sell your products in. Then, along with the US, we have Canada. 95% of Canada's population lives uh, very close to the US border, within something like 50 kilometers or, of the US border, right? So Toronto and so on, very close to the US also. So this market is more than, now there's more than 360 million people, right? Uh, <coughs> we have, this NAFTA is a free trade agreement. So here we have Mexico, here we have the USA, and here we have Canada. Now, there is no tax or tariff between these countries. You are working for Kia. Where are you going to put your car factory? The labor is very important cost for Kia. Mexico. Mexico, Mexico right? If the labor is a high cost, you can get much cheaper labor in Mexico. 
and you can sell your cars in the US without paying any tax. Okay? So Mexico had this thing called Macadillas, which was factories. Factories took off after NAFTA. After NAFTA was brought in, a lot of factories opened up in Mexico. What kind of factories are labor intensive? That labor is important. Cost of labor is high. More than cars? Something else? Where cost of labor is very high for the product. IT. IT? Okay, but Mexican people don't speak English very well. So IT is correct, but India usually. And IT we don't need uh, to be as close, right? But I'm thinking of clothes, right? Or cement. Do you know cement? Yes. Mexico now has the biggest cement company in the world, right? Uh, Cemex. Cemex is a big Mexican company, right? Because they can make cement with the low cost of labor and then transport to the US and sell in the US here. Or they can make clothes, a lot of clothes at a low cost of labor and sell into the US. So this is called an export platform. Do you understand platform? So it's the same for Ireland in the EU. Ireland is also an export platform. Okay? The Ireland doesn't have any tariff with Germany or France or England. So the US company comes to Ireland, Dell Computers or Google or Facebook, right? They can sell their products in Europe. It's like a platform for selling, exporting in. So, <clears throat> there is, it, started, it was ratified in 1994, so all tariffs have been dropped since 2008. There's no tariff. Okay? Uh, it's easier to do business, and it's one of the world's largest and richest markets in the world. So we can look at this as one group or one region, right? If you're selling in the US, you also don't have to pay tariffs to sell in Canada or to sell in Mexico. Okay, but it's not a common market. We, the goods can move with no tax, but the people can't move, right? Especially Mexicans have to, are not allowed to enter the US without any visa. Okay, but of course, a lot of Mexicans enter illegally every year. <coughs> Uh, you can see on the TV some problems of the Canadian people who come to the US and fall in love with the US person. But they have to go back to Canada, they don't have a visa, something like that. Right? When, do you know, did you see How I Met Your Mother? This is US comedy, right? One of the women is from Canada and she comes to the US. Right? So it's not... Canada and US don't have a labor market like Europe. Right? Canadians need a visa to work in the US. Their visa runs out, they have to go back to Canada. So, uh, we have this DOR CAFTA, Central American Tr Free Trade Agreement. Okay? Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua and the United States. So again, they want to reduce the tariffs and make uh, increasing the trade and employment. So we can also invest in... Some of these countries have high political and economic risk. So some country, companies prefer to invest in Mexico. But in the future they can also be growing. Then we have Meriscore in South America. Okay, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay and Europe. <coughs> Europe uh, Paraguay. So this is the second largest one after the, the NAFTA. It has a market of 220 million with a GDP of 1 trillion. So again, this is a free trade area. So you, you can set up a factory in Brazil, sell in Argentina with no tariffs. Okay? So, and perhaps in the future we can see some agreements between the Meriscore and uh, North America, but these days one problem is that uh, the US is a very capitalist uh, culture, right? But these days in South America they've taken a turn to the left. Bolivia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Brazil, right? They all have uh, elected very left-sided uh, governments, right? So the US, the relationship of the US with the US government is not as good as before. Okay? But hopefully 
in the future they can uh, make an agreement there to join up. So in the last three decades in Latin America, they have moved a lot from military dictatorships. We had Pinochet in Chile, okay? we had uh, also Argentina, uh, Korea also had this kind of military dictatorship, right? Before, in the 70s, at the same time as South America, right? A little bit similar. But Korea has done better economically since it became a democracy, right? Than other countries. Uh, so, <clears throat> when in South America you had these kind of problems where you can have, when you had a military dictatorship, the army is very powerful in the country. In Egypt also they had similar, Pakistan, they have similar situation. So what happens here is that some foreign companies gave bribes to the military governments or the high up guys, generals, right? In order to get the natural resources like oil or those things from the South American countries. Uh, then. This is one of the reasons why the countries are swinging left these days, right? For example, in Venezuela, in the 1960s, Venezuela was an extremely rich country, right? Then we have military dictatorship and they sell, uh, for corruption, the generals sell the resources. The foreign company deposits $2 million, $3 million in their bank account in Switzerland, right? And they give the contract to the foreign company. Like, you can take the oil without paying any tax for the next 100 years, right? Is that a good contract? Take the oil from Venezuela without paying any tax for 100 years? Do you want a contract? It's very profitable, right? So then what happened is you had Hugo Chavez came to power in Venezuela, very left-sided, and he said, I'm nationalizing all the oil companies. Do you understand nationalizing? I'm just taking back, it's now Venezuela's property, right? So then he was ostracized a little bit like Cuba. For example, when Hugo Chavez is speaking at the UN, Obama makes sure he has a meeting somewhere else with all the important people, so nobody can listen to Hugo Chavez's speech. A little bit like kids, right? Playing with each other. But we have this kind of issue, right? That there was some kind of corruption by the military dictatorship and because of that reason, there was some bad contract signed with foreign governments and nowadays the people are moving on to the left more national to get back uh, some of the things for their own country and it's making a kind of friction relationship with the North America. So anyway, <coughs> mainly we had some privatization and other policy reforms. And Latin America has 600 million people, okay, and it has a lot of resources, like it has the Amazon jungle, it has wood, it has oil, okay, paper, and so on. So, we have uh, some Latin American Integration Association, to make the Latin American common market, okay, with the middle, Central America, and Mexico would also be Latin America. And the Caribbean community and common markets. Do you know the Caribbean? Do you want to go to the Caribbean? Nice weather. <clears throat> so, the Euro zone is the best example of uh, economic and monetary union. So, the Euro zone had an FTA. It had a customs union and then the economic and monetary union. So we have the euro. Some people say the euro was a mistake, but uh, not all of the countries in the EU are using the euro, right? About 17 countries use the euro currency, but there are about 27 countries in the EU. For example, the UK and Sweden are in the EU, but they don't use the euro currency. Okay, so they didn't join the monetary union. Uh, also Denmark. No, don't have Yes, Denmark is in the EU but doesn't use the euro, right? But pegs its currency to the euro, so it's quite similar. Uh, Switzerland and Norway are not in the EU or the euro. Why? Why do you think Switzerland or Norway are not in the EU or the euro? 
they just don't agree with some of the points uh, they must uh, they must meet to become a member of the youth. What kind the of points are important? It's too good, so you separate the entry. Yeah, the they would need to pay uh, way more than they would get from EU, right? Mm -hmm. Like well, for example. Norway has a lot of oil, right? Has a lot. Of, Norway has a lot of oil that it doesn't want to share with the other countries. Okay, or Switzerland has a very light regulation on finance. So one of the reason Switzerland is a prosperous country is because of light regulation on finance, right? So where are where does uh, Kim Jong Un keep his money? His billions of dollars. Switzerland, right? So you can get benefit by keeping his money. He keeps it in the bank, right? Then they can invest the money and use the money. So Switzerland, I guess, doesn't want the regulation, the EU regulation, the EU law. They want to have their own regulation, okay? Norway, more so, is kind of on the edge anyway, but uh, <coughs> they, are, have, they want to be able to negotiate their own fishery, especially fishing as well for Norway, fishing and oil. So the UK is going to have a referendum in 2017. There is an election in the U UK now. Soon, if David Cameron wins the election, then he's going to have a referendum in 2017 about whether the UK will stay in the EU or not. So, it's, some people are debating whether it was not, not the customs union or the labour union, but whether the monetary union was a good idea or not, having the same money. It's uh, debatable. Um, sorry. Yes. Do you know how it's going to be, maybe? Or in the UK? Yeah. I guess they'll stay in the EU. Okay. Yes. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Just David Cameron is using negotiating tactic, mm -hmm. because the UK normally are more light regulation. Mm, we said that the UK has different type of law than <coughs> than the rest of Europe. They have common law, and the rest of Europe use civil law, right? But also the financial industry is very important to the UK. So they don't want strict regulation on finance, a little bit like Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So they, they want to negotiate with the EU. So if they have a referendum, it gives them a stronger negotiating position. Can you understand? So they will, David Cameron will say to Angela Merkel or the French president, well, you better do this because if you do, don't do this, then maybe the British people will decide to leave the EU, right? So you have to try and keep them happy. So even he said that he's, it's a base for negotiating, negotiating in Europe. So I don't think it will be uh, negative. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but you never know, you never know. Just, that's what I think. So we have Eastern Europe. Uh, Right now we have conflict in Eastern Europe, in the Ukraine. We have the Baltic states, satellite states of the former Soviet Union. And they have uh, moved towards uh, market reforms. There are new business opportunities available. One of the problems in the Ukraine is that some of the people in the Ukraine wanted to make some trade agreement with the EU, right? Towards eventually joining the EU, maybe. Some people in the Ukraine wanted to stay uh, closer to Russia, okay? So they have different ideas about where they want to go, right? Which direction. So these countries are changing to uh, some version of uh, free market and the capitalism. So we can see that countries like Poland, for example, uh, has joined the EU. So I know that some factories, Dell Computers, do you know Dell Computers? They're having the computer room. They changed their factory from Ireland to Poland. Because the same as Mexico and the US. You have Poland, you could put here Poland and here Germany. Okay, so where is the cost of labor cheaper, in Poland or in Germany? Poland, Poland right? So Korean, some Korean car companies have also moved to Eastern Europe. Romania is in the EU, right? Bulgaria so on, Poland, okay, uh, Latvia, okay, uh, so uh, these countries, 
can have a lower cost of labor and uh, uh, <coughs> labor intensive companies like again clothes and uh, car manufacturing can, have been moving there. Okay. So every country in Eastern Europe has its own economic situation and it's moving to the market driven economy. But generally they're privatizing state owned enterprises, establishing free pricing systems, relaxing import controls and wrestling with inflation. There was some problems in a couple of countries that when the communist regime fell that some kind of mafia group was getting some power, managed to get control of some, uh, used to be owned by the state, right? Used to be owned by the state, uh, private and made into the private <coughs> enterprise, right? So there's, there's uh, different types of challenges for different countries, okay? So the Czech Republic has fared better than the other European country. Uh, Yugoslavia had uh, a lot of violence, so Yugoslavia divided into different countries, Croatia, uh, Serbia, and Montenegro, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and uh, Slovenia. Okay. So the Czech Republic, you guys can tell us about the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Yeah, I, it's better than the, the three European countries, but I think it's maybe just because it's closer to the Western world. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe it gets some good ideas from the Western world. And it's even more on the West than Germany. So, like, bigger part. So. I think the main difference between our countries was always the Czech Republic was closer to Germany mm -hmm. and Slovakia was closer to Russia. Okay. So why did uh, why did you make uh, two countries from we Czechoslovakia? Didn't like each other. <laughs> we didn't like each we didn't like each other probably. No, no, we like each other. We just wanted Slovakia wanted to be an independent country. That's it. Okay. Um, I, I Is it a different? Are the people a different race? Different <coughs> race. Not race. No. no, it's a different nation where two countries were together and different they language. decided one day they had a meeting in government and they said, you know, Slovakia said, okay, we would like to be separated and Czech Republic said, okay, and we separated. And then they became worse. For like, real? I mean, economy. Our yeah. economy? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. So which country is better? Czech Republic. Czech Republic. <laughs> huh? see. Better economy. Yeah. So what kind of uh, businesses have moved, or how has the economy changed there over the last few years? Um, for example, the, the second biggest city in the Czech Republic is often called um, European Silicon Valley, and a lot of lot of big uh, companies go there because it's just in the middle of Europe. What's the name of the city? Uh, Brno. Or not. Okay. Yeah, and there's the I don't know Honeywell and Linux and Amazon wants to be their their warehouse and a lot a lot of big maybe also Dell and a lot of big companies. Yeah. Okay, so there's the some Kia opportunities factory. there. Hmm? The Kia factory. You have Kia factory? Yes. So we have also Kia factory and Hyundai factory and also and Hyundai. <laughs> do you want to work for Kia and Hyundai? No. You've been to Korea now, so you put on your CV <laughs> when you get there. What? And Skoda drive the car. All right. So we can see a Czech Republic is also a good central location. That's important, right? Ireland is on the edge. Greece is on the edge. Portugal is on the edge of Europe. Location is also important. So if you're in the center of Europe, it means that you can. Here's Europe. You're in the center. You can deliver easily. So Germany has this advantage, right? Germany is quite bang in the center, right? But if you have Greece or Portugal, Ireland is on the edge. It's not as easy to transport or communicate with uh, Europe. So, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, do you know these countries? Yes, Baltic countries, close to Denmark, right? Germany is here and the Baltic countries are here. Russia is here. Okay, so kind of in between and at the north. So, uh, these countries have been doing well, right? So they, they made a liberalized, tariff-free, open market economy. 
And uh, we said before that there is some problem with organized crime, organized crime like mafia, who got control of after the government fell, there was kind of vacuum. So we have some a little bit of problem with organized crime, but uh, these countries have been doing well economically. So then we have the Commonwealth of Independent States, uh, CIS. So after uh, the USSR split up, uh, including the 12 re republics after the formation of the Baltic states. So this is a kind of a loose political and economic alliance with no central government. And the 12 members, uh, former members of the USSR, have a similar history of central planning, central government, strong central government. Okay. Uh, so they cooperate closely, which can help each other to make a market economy. And they have some difference of opinion about uh, currency, economic, and military. So uh, this is Russia is the uh, main member here, right? Then we have just some of the countries surrounding surrounding uh, Russia. So do you guys know which countries are in this uh, CIS grouping? nation group, West Africa, Southern Africa, development community, uh, which is the most advanced, right? So South Africa is the most advanced country in Africa, right? Uh, East African community. Recently in East Africa we had a terrible terrorist attack at the university, right? In Kenya, they just went into the university, they came from Somalia, some terrorist group shot all the students. It was very sad, right? So, in Africa they're also making their, their own uh, economic communities. Mainly they're looking at the EU. Most of these uh, groups are looking at the EU because the EU was very early, right? Just after World War II. The reason that they made the EU, the first reason was peace, right? They thought if we make a stronger economic cooperation between our countries, then we're not going to be at war with each other. Okay? So that was the number one objective of the EU, and if people ask was the EU successful or not, then if that was the objective, you have to say yes. Right? It was successful, because Europe was always at war for thousands of years. Always, there was always a war in Europe. But since the EU, since the World War II, there hasn't been many wars, right? Just in Yugoslavia, we had the conflict there. Inside, between, let's say, Germany and France, and France and England were always fighting before with each other, making arrangements with each other and fighting, but it has finished. So this kind of putting our economic community together can help to stop conflict between states. So in Africa, they are also trying to follow the model of the EU in this case. Right, move to the FTA and Customs Union, then on to the labor market. What, what do you think about in Asia? Would you like to see a union between Japan and Korea and China for starters, just even if you just took those three countries? I think it's better for South Korea and China. 
Why not Japan? <laughs> this current situation is uh, South Korea and Japan. The relationship between South Korea and Japan is uh, becomes bad mm -hmm. because of uh, historical problems. Uh, yes. Yeah. But yeah. Germany and the UK had bad relationship, <laughs> very bad relationship. <laughs> after the war, but they put themselves together to make a union, so that they don't have problems anymore. No internet huh? And no internet between... They did this on purpose, so that they don't have any problems. They have to have a better relationship. Korea and Japan hosted the World Cup together in 2002, right? <laughs> it was successful. Yeah. So, the idea is that if you make the closer ties, then the relationship can get better over time, right? So, what about you guys, Chinese students? What do you think? Uh, Korea says just, just me and China. We don't want Japan. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to say uh, to them? Uh, I don't want Japan to. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, uh, there is different culture between Eastern country and Western country. Mm -hmm. uh, East, uh, East, Eastern country already have a more uh, combination. Combination culture and uh, um, usually Western country this culture is always uh, uh, we we build, uh, we have a uh, same purpose and we are going to find it and uh, so let let's make a uh, 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 so. Uh, so let's make it a, a, a union, and uh, uh, but in Asia and uh, in the Eastern culture, uh, it's different. Maybe the historical problems is more important. Uh, okay. Do okay. you think? Does Japan can apologize? <laughs> what, what if Japan says sorry about uh, that? Will you say okay then? No, I can't predict it. Huh? I can't predict it. Yeah. So there's some disputes still with the islands and so on, right? Yeah. So it may be a political problem. Uh, hopefully they can solve that and then get closer together economically. Okay. So <coughs> large markets like this, if we have a large market group, it's better for businesses which has mass production and mass distribution. So we talked about it in the UK compared to the US, right? You start a small, let's say you start even a juice, making some new juice, health juice. You do that in the UK, that's great, right? You hit your market, you start shop in shopping centers all over the country. In the US, it's a really big opportunity, right? But if, especially if you're making something which we need economies of scale, like cars. In cars we need economies of scale. The more cars we make, the cheaper it is. Yes. It's better to enter a, a big market, right, where we can sell a lot of them. So these kind of groups have programs to help economic group grow, to cooperate. Okay? And make some regional infrastructure like highways or train lines between countries and help the economic development overall. Like in Europe, they have European Investment Bank. In Asia, also they have an Asian Investment Bank to help the small and medium-sized companies. <clears throat> so, what about pricing? In the past, companies charged different prices in European markets, such as Colgate. Different European countries, they had different prices. But What's the problem? If I charge a different price for something in Mexico, there's no tariff, what's the problem here? I'm Colgate, I charge just one dollar for toothpaste in Mexico. I charge two dollars for toothpaste in the USA. Can you see any problem? There's no tariff between Mexico and the USA. Can you see any problem? What problem do you see? It's against huh? I think it's 
It's not against the free trade agreement, no. You can charge a different price in a different country, but what could happen? So somebody could have an idea. I'm going to start exporting toothpaste. Buy it in Mexico and sell it in the US. Okay? Just you could start just buying and selling there, right? So that could be a problem. Okay? So as long as products from lower price markets cannot move to higher price markets, then the price different price scheme is okay, right? You can make a different price scheme. We said in China the uh, price is different for the DVD than in the US, okay. but it's not easy to move. Okay. But nowadays, companies are starting more uniform pricing, okay. reducing the number of brands such as Nestle and Unilever. So Nestle will have the same price, Mexico, USA and Canada, Unilever, the same price, maybe also the same brand in these, in these kind of groups, regional groups, okay. or just in Europe in Europe as a, as a whole. Uh, so let's uh, discuss about the People's Republic of China. So after the US, well, nowadays China has passed Japan. So uh, the US is the number one economy, China is the number two economy. When will China be the number one economy in the world? Soon. When? Tomorrow. Very soon. <laughs> Economists use different ways of calculating, so some economists might say that already it might be bigger because of the way they calculate things, right? Maybe 2020? 2020, yeah. something like that. Okay, China's growth rate is higher than the US, 7% against 2 or 3%, right? So China's growing faster, so we expect that uh, China will be the biggest economy soon. What are the problems, challenges for China? What are the main challenges for China in the future? Hmm? Environment, right? Clean water, clean air. Another challenge for China? I think um, income stimulus. In, income inequality? Yes. There's a small percentage, again, like you, 1% is a lot of the wealth. Yes. yes. I oh. think. Hmm? Sorry. Um, yes. The reputation of uh, made in China. Okay. And, uh, all right, so for the companies expanding abroad, right? What do you think? What about demographics? What about demographics in China? China has a one-child policy. What effect can that have on the Chinese economy? There's got to be a higher percentage of pensioners compared to working people, right? Higher percentage of pensioners compared to working people. So more uh, pressure on the working people. And also you could have one person is responsible for looking after the older family, the parents by themselves, and also the kids, right? Uh, so in the longer term, we still don't know how that will affect the economy, right? Uh, but at the moment it's growing uh, well. Uh, China has a dual economic system, embracing socialism along with many tenets of capitalism. Has produced an economic boom with expanded opportunity for foreign investment. So, if we look at the US, the US has a two-party system. We can say that the US has a two-party system and China has a one-party system. Right? Yes. So, in the US, there are all, you only have a choice of two parties. It can be the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. In China, you only have a choice of one party. Okay, the Socialist or the Communist Party, right? So, uh, it's a little bit different political system, right? There are other parties, but they're very small and they're not going to win the election, okay? And usually the people who join the members of the Communist Party get some more advantage in society. Is that true? If you join the Young Communist Party, you can have a better job opportunity or promotion, that kind of thing. No. Or in the past, that's finished now? Uh, yeah, in the past or maybe in the 90s. 
It doesn't matter about your political alliance now, or getting a job, or getting a promotion. Do you agree with him? I don't agree. Uh, if if um, the person has the party, yes. it will get a higher salary. The person in the party might get a higher salary. Yes. Are you guys from different areas of China? Uh, I think... Uh, 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 I think maybe uh, if we draw other parties in China, uh, the small parties uh, will get more uh, opportunities. Cause uh, uh, we have such a ordination, uh, we have such a law to uh, make uh, say, uh, to make the, uh, the small parties get. Uh, uh, Percent of the uh, uh, of the jobs or some or other. Okay, so you're making some laws to promote the smaller parties yes. in China. So you think the smaller parties will get bigger and bigger, right? But how long do you think China will have the one party system for? <laughs> in some countries, even though they have two parties, just they have almost like one party system because one government has been in power for so long, right? Ireland is almost like one party system because either it's a two party system, right? Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael, but both of the parties are almost exactly the same. If you look at their manifesto and read their documents, they have very little disagreement about what policy they should do, right? They're both just right of centre, slightly right of centre. And uh, one of these two parties has been in power in Ireland since since the 1920s, since Ireland got the independence, right? So you think that this one party will be in power in China for a long time? Yeah, of course. Okay, what advantages, what advantages can China get from one party system? Singapore also had a one party system. What's one word you could use? Stability, right? Stability. People know, companies know, businesses know what to expect. They know this government is going to be in power. The government can also make more long-term planning. In the two-party system, the government can make short-term planning. They have an election in five, four or five years, right? So before the election, they might reduce the taxes, right? or give the people some extra benefit or something.